Hello and welcome to the Boxing Supplement. You are watching the £140 update part 1. With a lot of attention on the £147 at the moment, I'd like to drop 7 and talk to you about the light welterweights. It's a talent rich division and there's a lot of exciting fights that can be made. Top dog of the division, Danny Swift Garcia. He's 28 and 0 with 60 knockouts. Uh, he's 26 years old and hails from Philadelphia. He's got a brilliant CV for a young man with wins over Eric Morales, two of them, uh, Amir Khan, Zab Judah, Lucas the Machine Matisse, and uh, Mauricio Herrera most recently. But I want to go back to uh, the 14th of September 2013 where he fought Lucas Matisse at the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas as chief support to Mayweather Canelo. Um, it was a brilliant win for Danny Garcia. He won a unanimous decision. Uh, the early rounds belonged to Matisse. He was on the front foot uh, looking for those power punches as he was a very ha heavy handed fighter. His jab is almost like a power punch in itself. Uh, the right, it was a match up really between the powerful right and the left hooker. But Danny Garcia was very cautious. He was brilliantly um, defensive and um, fought a really mature fight. He didn't lo load up the left hook early on. He uh, seemed like he respected the power of uh, the machine uh, and just waited his time. By the mid rounds, he completely took control of the fight and uh, definitely deserved the unanimous decision, in my opinion. He. Um, uh, he was catching Matisse quite often in the 6th and 7th and by the end of the 7th or maybe early 8th uh, Matisse's right eye had completely swollen shut uh, which is not a good thing against a guy with a, with a left hook like uh, Danny Garcia unfortunately for Matisse and fortunately for Danny Garcia Matisse's corner didn't even have an end swell so the swelling was really really bad and there was no they, no improvements could be made they couldn't help the guy his right eye was closed and he was a one one eyed fighter for the last you know the second half of the fight you could say and it was a fight of two halves um, it wasn't that Matisse was dominating early on but control was t totally taken from him in uh, the latter rounds Matisse did uh, go down in the 11th Danny Garcia landed a right to the body, followed by a left and another right, which was sort of around the back of the head, but even so, he went tumbling down into the ropes, and that was the first knockdown of Lucas Matisse's career. Uh, not long before that, Matisse landed a beautiful right shot that uh, sent Danny Garcia's mouthpiece flying out of the ring. Um, but yeah, um, Lucas Matisse was very gracious in defeat, uh, no excuses were made. And uh, yeah, Danny Garcia deserved it. A great performance by him, and it really put him in in line for a move up to 147 and a shot at Floyd Money Mayweather, pound for pound number one. It's the fight that everybody wants, and it's a fight that at that, at that time made sense for Danny Garcia to look t towards taking over the next year. Fast forward, we'll rewind now. But fast forward from that fight to his next fight, uh, the fifth, on the 15th of March 2014, he fought Mauricio Herrera at the Coliseo Ruben Rodriguez Arena in Bayamon, Puerto Rico. Um, his, as usual, his WBC and WBA titles are on the line. Maybe Ring Magazine, I think he's got one of them as well, why not? Um, key point in this fight was um, open scoring. Uh, doesn't happen in a lot of states in the US, but uh, the WBC convinced the Puerto Rican Boxing Commission to allow it for this fight. So at the fourth and eighth round, there would uh, at the end of those rounds, there would be uh, the the scores would be announced, and both times Danny Garcia was ahead. Controversial uh, majority decision victory for Danny. Uh, a lot of people had Mauricio Herrera winning the fight by a couple of rounds. He had a very awkward style and boxed really well that night. Uh, he went to the body well, he was very good at going in and out. And Danny, it looked like he had an off night. Maybe because it was a sort of homecoming for him. Fighting in Puerto Rico, he's a 
Philadelphian, but his uh, parents are both Puerto Rican, and so is his family. Still has a lot of family there. So yeah, it was sort of uh, billed as a homecoming. A lot of pressure with that, and maybe he was loading up with the left to go for the knockout in front of the home fans. I don't know, but his timing was off. Uh, he just couldn't adapt to uh, Mauricio Herrera's style, and that is the story of the fight, really. Um, Herrera connected with uh, 221 punches out of 695, giving him 32%, with Danny 204 of 675 at 30%. Uh, it looked to me that the heavier shots were coming from Danny Garcia, and the crowd certainly saw it that way as well. Uh, going crazy every sh every shot that landed and some that even didn't land, you know, and may have swayed the judges' uh, scorecards slightly, but it's their job. They're professionals here. They, sh they shouldn't be influenced by this. And um, obviously, Danny Garcia is the big money fighter, and um, if there's going to be any corruption and swaying, it's going to go to his way, unfortunately. Um, but I think, as most people would agree, he lost the fight. Uh, Paulie Malignaggi uh, commentating um, had made a great quote that night saying it's amazing how the judges have such a close seat to the action and yet they're missing such a great fight and it was a great fight certainly from uh, Mauricio Herrera who was very unlucky um, so yeah let's uh, move on to possibly the number two 140 pounder certainly under the Golden Boy promotion banner that's uh, Lucas Matisse and he was involved in what was surely what what could be fight of the year. It was an action-packed slug, action slugfest with um, John Molina Jr., who was coming up from lightweight. He had an impressive win, I guess, an impressive stoppage win over Mickey Bay, who fights under TMT. Uh, Mickey Bay boxed uh, Molina's ass off for ten rounds but got tagged in the 10th and Molina being the knockout artist he has got his man out there he had that um, obviously that TKO loss in the first round to Antonio DeMarco at lightweight also but that was more of a case of he should have just took a knee he was a bit amateurish really and just ducking and into the ropes like that and taking the shots the referee had to do his job and stop the fight but yeah back to um, Stub Hub Centre Carson California uh, Thurman Diaz on top of the bill but Matisse Molina completely stole the show that night um, Matisse coming out strong but the heavier shots, the eye-catching shots were definitely coming from Molina who looked like the extra five pounds uh, did him the world of good he was able to take shots well and throw some serious bombs in that fight um, in fact he put Matisse down in the second round with um, a right to the top of the head above the ear um, and then again in the fifth, which was, I don't know if it was a knockdown, it seemed like it was on the back of the head, but uh, from where the referee was standing, maybe he couldn't see that. But but yeah, he put uh, Matisse down twice, so that would be his uh, second and third knockdown of his career, and only the last two fights. Um, in the third round, a uh, key point was to mention that um, the left eye got damaged this time of uh, Matisse's. There was a clash of heads, a really bad clash of heads that... Uh, blood uh, coming from the top of the head of um, Molina as well and maybe a cut behind the ear it's hard to tell but yeah it's a bloody bloody good fight um, Matisse wearing Molina down by the 8th he had him down accumulation of punches a uh, little shove to put him on his bum um, but yeah it was the gladiator against the machine and the Argentinian prevailed and uh, got the uh, knockout in the 11th after putting Molina down again in the 10th um, which followed a bit of a verbal exchange between uh, Joe Goose and the trainer of John Molina and the ringside uh, doctor uh, the doctor was basically in the corner explaining to Molina the condition he was in the cuts that he had and maybe he shouldn't you know maybe he shouldn't go out and maybe should quit on his stool of course Joe Goose didn't want that to happen and Molina I imagine wouldn't want to hear that so yeah he sent him out and uh, there was only another 30 seconds of the fight in round 11 and he was a beaten man Molina but I've never seen a guy 
uh, gain so much from a loss. Uh, I'm certainly on board as a massive Molina fan. Um, and yeah, I'd, I don't think they <laughs> they need to have a rematch. Um, I don't think either fight needs to be put through that again. That was the sort of um, slugfest that certainly put some miles on the clock and uh, shortens your career. Um, but yeah, that fight for me is one of the one of the best I've certainly seen, and will go down in history as one of the one of the better slugfests of recent times. I'm sure. Um, one thing that did shock me was the uh, the punch stats. Matisse landing 275 of 573, 48%, great percentage there, with Molina 104 of 392. Um, it was clear that Matisse was forcing the action a lot and was on the front foot, but but I, I thought Molina was landing more shots than that, but certainly the eye-catching ones early on in the first half of the fight were coming from him. But yeah, fight of the year, what's going to beat it? Can't wait to find out if uh, anything can. Um, but yeah, that. thank you for watching. That is part one of the £140 update. Um, the next update will include Adrian Broner, who uh, recently faced Carlos Molina, and also focus on some of the top rank fighters, Ruslan Provodnikov, the WBO uh, title holder, um, Mike Alvarado, who's fighting Juan Manuel Marquez soon, and also Brandon Rios, who possibly will be coming back down to 140 to make it a really exciting division. Okay, thank you for watching and please follow us on Twitter at BoxingTBS. See you for now.